Yep. Another, another defense from the government is that um, external forces have to do with, you know, how the economy runs and all of the budget, um, ex definitely ex external yeah. forces have to do with it. Yeah. How much impact do external forces have on our economy? Well, external forces have an impact on all economies. The Ghana is not excluded. Our neighbor, Cote d'Ivoire, exports pretty much the same commodities that we are exporting. In fact, we now have oil, and they are trying to, to, to get oil uh, uh, as well. But why is it that the external forces haven't collapsed the Ivorian economy? <laughs> we are just next door to them. Mm -hmm. In fact, the Ivorian economy is booming. And their budget is, they had to have another budget just because they had more money than they had budgeted. We are now going for bailout. It's a contrast, <laughs> a very big contrast. So, in fact, if you look, Kwesi, between 2001 and 2008, that period when the MPP was in power, and the last six years, cocoa and gold prices have been 50 percent higher, 50 percent higher. Cocoa and gold prices have been 50 percent higher in these last six years than they were in 2001 to 2008. So, the government cannot really say that that positive terms of trade effect is a problem. Hmm. It's, it, it, it's, it cannot. The, the, the data doesn't support that assessment. Okay. Now, in your in your um, will the uncle hold lecture, you gave a, a rather vivid picture of how things have, have worked in the different areas. Um, you, you named it the odometer. <laughs> yes. They are all showing red, as, <laughs> as we can see from That's the right. demonstration that we yes. put on the screen. Yes. Um, how different was this during your party's, you know, tenure, the 80s? I think, and I think, I think it, it is the, the, the odometer is a vivid, you know, um, presentation of the state of our economy. Mm. As you, you, you point out, I look at different variables, and I look at it from blue to red, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of where that's the automata point, yep. you know, very red, you know, a little, you know, reddish, yep. of, you know, and then you go on that spectrum, yep. you know. But you're right that what we are seeing right now is a lot of the variables pointing towards red, which shows, you know, something not right and, and a bad state of health for the economy. Um, and for many of these same variables during our time, uh, they were much better, uh, more towards the bluish side than the reddish side. If you look at economic growth, for example, you know, we ended up with an 8.4 percent growth without oil. With oil, you're ending up with 3.5 percent growth this year, and so on. You look at the exchange rate depreciation. In the eight years of the MPP government, the exchange rate depreciated by about 50 percent. Now, in six years now, they've done 98 percent, and we are yet to see 2015 mm -hmm. and 2016. You know, you will end up, that record will show very clearly that we are very good at exchange rate management. You look at the debt distress. We left a debt level of 9.5 billion, 33 percent of GDP. They are at 76 billion, 67 percent of GDP, and climbing. You know, they, they, you know, so they needed an IMF bailout. We didn't uh, at, at that point. Uh, well, why and would then, argue, though, that you had funds from HIPI? Oh, absolutely. And I think it's very, very important. And you didn't get the funds from HIPI by just uh, getting it from, 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 you had to work for those funds mm -hmm. from HIPI. We went through a, a HIPI program. At that time, many people did not, you know, in fact, appreciate. Uh, some people were, were arguing uh, the other side that it was a wrong move to do. But we had debt relief of about $4 billion. Uh, but you had to put in—you don't get HIPIC relief just by, by saying you want it. Mm. You've got to put in the work. We, we had to do the fiscal consolidation. Uh, and this is why you saw all the indicators moving in the right direction. Mm. And not only did we get— into HIPIC. We got out of HIPIC. We became a lower middle income economy and became the first post HIPIC country to issue a sovereign bond on the capital markets, a 750 million bond that we did to signal that we had actually left mm. HIPIC uh, and, 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 and our, our economy was now in lower middle income status. Uh, but that is why we understand why it is important that you don't get back 
to that same position yeah. that you got out of. It's so painful to watch. As I said, I, I, it's, it's almost like watching a train wreck happen. You see it coming, and we kept warning them. This path you're taking is going to lead to a disaster, but they wouldn't listen. You know, it's because we were part of this whole HIPIC experiment, we, we know that it's, once you've gotten that relief, it's no longer available. So now we are going to have to, you know, basically do it ourselves, mm. uh, do the adjustment that gets us out of the, the, the pickle that we are in at the moment. Okay. And the, the government assembled a team of experts at um, Akuse, I believe, yeah. to um, deliberate ways to come out of this <laughs> rather yes. pathetic situation. Yes. First of all, were you invited? And what do you think of this? event was it worth it at all well i wasn't invited but i many many other people were invited and and, and that is fine uh our, our party in fact took a position that we were not going to participate mm. in in saint chi because it was clearly an attempt to manufacture a consensus there was no sincerity in saint chi and in fact the events after saint chi have proven us right saint chi came out with a 22-point recommendation. Now you ask yourself, how many of those 22 recommendations have been implemented? Mm. One of the key recommendations out of the Sinchi was to say that taxes should no longer be increased, that the tax burden on the Ghanaian business and individual is too high. And so government should rather look for ways to widen the tax net and not increase, increase taxes. Tax this was the key recommendation out of Sinchi. Immediately after that, they went for the budget. <laughs> and what, what happened? They increased all sorts of taxes, right? And in 2015, they have increased, again, all sorts of taxes. So this Sinchi was supposed to be the considered opinion of our experts. Now you totally ignore that. So what was it for? What was it for? So we, we really don't think it was a sincere effort uh, to, to, to bring consensus in the management of the economy. Mm. I mean, I would, I would think that um, anything like that would have you know, an invite sent to you and other people that yes, I can think I about. Yes, didn't, I didn't get an invite anyway. anyway. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> moving on the same on the same thread, um, you, do you feel vindicated? Because you did warn them. I, I mean, you were in the news yes. saying that this path is going to end up on the doorstep of the IMF. <laughs> yes. And just a couple of weeks ago, we have indeed gone for an IMF bailout. Yes. How do you feel? You feel vindicated? Not really. I feel sad. The, the whole, you know, when you watch, as I said, you know, a train wreck coming and you're telling the driver, hey, it's going to happen, don't, don't go this fast or whatever, and they ignore you, and, and, and you are part of the train. You know, I, we are all Ghanaians. If it's good, it's good for all of us. If it's bad, it's bad for all of us. So there's no, you know, sense that, oh, yes, I told you so. I think that, that I rather feel sad because it was completely avoidable completely avoidable if we had done the right things and heeded to good advice from our own people. Shouldn't there be mechanisms, though, where the government is more or less forced to bring on all informed opinion? Because obviously we have, um, like even reading your, your, your report, the will the uncle hold there's this part where you say we you, i told the government and the government said no but when imf told them they said yes sir, master, we, will, we, 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 hear you, we will listen that's right why should that happen shouldn't we have a mechanism where we we, we tap into our own you know expertise yeah. before we no, go out for, it, it, for it, we should and i i believe that uh, a lot of what we need to do i mean Ghanaians you know, in Ghana and outside Ghana can tell you. They can analyze the problems and, and tell you exactly what we need to do. And, and, and for example, when I said we need a fiscal responsibility act to stop this type of reckless expenditure, to control all of that, the Minister of Finance said no. I didn't know what I was talking about. Now the IMF has come and said the same thing. They're like, oh, fine, yeah, we think we need it. We are going to do it. Uh, and, and, and I think it's, 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 uh, it's rather sad. But I agree with you that I think if there is a good faith effort made, you know, at, at everybody, you know, from academia to the business community to industry can have 
you know, their contribution to how things should be. And I think that our governments need to be open to ideas. A lot of our problems can be solved with ideas, not with money. Throwing money at a problem is very, you know, easy for governments to do. But if you have a good idea, it could be worth more than its weight in gold. You can generate so much money from a very good idea. And the ideas are within Ghana, and they are outside Ghana. You know, and we just need to go and tap those ideas within Ghana, within Africa, within the wider diaspora. Uh, and, and the wider world, we need to go and look for ideas that will work. It's not about money. It's about good, sound policy. Mm. That is what will make the change in our economy. Talking about the diaspora, let's, let's shift gears okay. uh, you know, slightly. Talking about the diaspora, you've also indicated that you tap into the diaspora when the government yeah. you know, comes into power. Um, most people in the diaspora, Ghanaians living in the diaspora, are also interested in dual citizenship yeah. because they believe that that gives them, yeah. you know, the freedom to go outside of Ghana Absolutely. to seek whatever pastures there are yeah. and then still come home to help yeah. with the development of the country. Is, it, is this on your radar at all? Oh, very much so. Very, very much so. It's people who develop countries not resources. We have seen, you know, the whole resource case literature has shown us that resource, having resources per se doesn't mean you will develop. In fact, it can send you backwards. Some of the mm. countries that have gone forward are countries which have had no resources at all, and, but they've been able to move because they have invested in human capital, in people. What, it's, what should be very interesting is that today, the United States, probably the most advanced country in the world today, is trying to attract people to come with skills to help the United States move forward. Mm -hmm. And this is very, very smart you know, economics, because you don't really invest in it, but you take it and you use it. You know, that is smart borrowing. <laughs> you, you see what I mean? The United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, they are tapping skills from other countries. Now, if the United States, with its advanced status, needs mm -hmm. skills, what do you think Ghana would need? So we cannot afford to, to sidestep our diaspora. It is one of the most important resources that we have. I don't think we've paid sufficient attention to it. It's one of our most important resources, and we've got to do it. There's got to be a paradigm shift and, and try to— I, I, I personally, and I will, I will try to sell this to my party, I personally feel that we need to even go beyond our diaspora. We need to look at the wider African diaspora. We can tap skills. We can introduce what I will call a gold card scheme. Mm. We can bring in skills, you know, from Rwanda, from, you know, Botswana, from South Africa. We can bring in skills. If we are trying to build a globally competitive economy, mm. we should be very open uh, in, in bringing in people who can help us build that economy. Mm. And it will not be to the disadvantage of Ghanaians. It will rather be to the advantage mm. of Ghanaians. So I think as, as, as we're talking about a diaspora, I'm very, very, very up on, on it. And I think we, we, should, we should really look to, to, to putting in place the mechanisms that will allow us to tap. Even retirees mm. from very, very top places. I mean, whether you are looking at NASA or you can find Ghanaians all over. Yeah. We should not hesitate. How about voting rights, though? Ghanaians abroad have also been clamoring to have the chance to vote, for I, instance. I, I agree. Is this feasible? I think it is feasible. And I think it, you know, it, yeah, I, think, I think it's a good thing. Um, but I think it's very, very important that for us to, to do, to go beyond our borders as we are doing, let's get the basics right. We have a country where we have not yet been able to issue national ID cards okay. to all of our population. National ID cards. We passed the National Identification Authority Act in 2008. It's been six years since just to issue cards so that we can uniquely identify our population. We are a population that is not uniquely identifiable. Mm. 
In the United States, everybody is uniquely identifiable by their social security number. Wherever you go, whether it's credit, you know, schools, health, you have a unique identification. Now, when you want to extend voting rights outside your borders, when you haven't been able to uniquely identify your citizens, you then begin to see the problems that that could bring. And I think that this is a good thing. We should let our citizens vote uh, who are outside the country, but we should really first uniquely identify them. Uh, and then we proceed. But the unique identification can take place within a year. I don't know why the Electoral Commission can issue 15 million voting cards in, in less than six months, and we need to just issue 25 million ID cards in six years. We are still struggling. Wouldn't, wouldn't the argument be that the, the database for Ghanaians living outside Ghana is not really accurate yet. Um, I believe yeah. these yeah, will but present I think, challenges. But, but I'm, I'm even talking about within Ghana that the national ID cards for Ghanaians residing oh, okay. in Ghana. That's right. We have had six years. This is the seventh mm. year. Since, and it got started and it has stalled. And it has, I mean, how, what does, would it take? This is a very technologically simple procedure. It's been done in so many other countries. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. So what is taking us mm. so long to issue a unique ID for everybody? Okay. It, it's, right. it's, it's, it's really unbelievable. All right. Now, reading your, your um, well, the anchor holder, I'm a bit obsessed with that document. Yes, so thank pardon you. me for <laughs> no problem. constantly referring to it. Yeah. But um, you, you allege that uh, the untold, I'm quoting you now, the, mm -hmm. uh, the untold story about the erratic gas supply from Nigeria is that Ghana owes Nigeria gas $100 million. Mm. Um, you say the Doomsaw crisis is more of a financial than a technical one. I, we have received reports that um, Nigeria was fined $10 million yeah. um, for reneging on its promise to supply Ghana gas. Yeah. How do we reconcile these two Well, well I, I think the, the issue is not difficult to reconcile. But I think the, the, the point here that I was making was that the Doomsaw crisis, the load shed in energy crisis that is crippling in our economy, uh, and hopefully, we, we all pray we'll, 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 we'll get over soon because of its debilitating effects. Mm. This crisis has more of a financial reason than a technical reason. And it goes back, you know, to 2012, you know, where VRA has increasingly gotten itself in a difficult position to, you know, open up letters of credit for the import of crude oil because it is, its balance sheet is, 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 is very bad. The government owes B VRA one billion Ghana series, and that has put VRA in a very difficult position. It could not import crude, so it had to use the Akosombo Dam more than was technically feasible. And it used it by 30 percent more in the last few years. And that meant that the level of the dam has gone down than it, further than it should have. Mm -hmm. you know, so you are now having to deal with some of the consequences of this. Uh, so the, I, I also reported, as you've just said, that we owe them at about 100 million. And in fact, the VRA subsequently came out to say, in fact, they owe them 120 million, not the 100 more. million. <laughs> they owe them more than what I had, I, had, I had said. And so for me, there is no problem uh, because contracts are different contracts. You, know, you can owe 10 million on one contract, one contract where somebody owes, you, owes you some, you know, so you, you, mm. you will have to fulfill your obligations mm. and, and their contract. But one of the issues that we, when we have to point out in this Doomsaw episode is that whenever the government feels like we need lies to watch football, you know, the black stars are playing, you know, everybody wants to see. For some reason, miraculously, the lights <laughs> come on. Everybody is watching because we, we think soccer is important and we are prepared <laughs> to pay the money to import the, the, the electricity at that time. Or, for example, at Christmas, suddenly there is no problem. 
and I hear, you know, this Easter also, you know, you had a lot more electricity. <laughs> so somehow, if there was a technical problem, <laughs> you shouldn't be able to generate it. But because there's more of a financial problem, they're able to pony up the money whenever they need to, to get that electricity. Mm. Uh, and, 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 and so that is the point that we're making. I see. Yes. I see. That's well made, too. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so back to the IMF bailout before we, we round up, just okay. quickly before we round up. Is it necessarily negative? Is the, is the deal necessarily negative? No, no, no. We, 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 are, we, are, we are not saying that it is necessarily negative. And as I said before, some of the things that we're saying that the government should do, we the IMF has said the same things, the government is now going to be made to do. Mm. In fact, I would have worried very much if the government had continued on that path that it was embarked on without the intervention of the IMF, because mm. it would have hurt the country even more. The IMF is going to come in and put in measures and monitor and make sure that, you know, everything is reported accurately, and they will monitor to make sure that, you know, what needs to be done will be done. The IMF will give us breathing room, and it will help us restore macroeconomic stability. But the whether we are able to use that breathing room properly and to grow this economy, the, the, the IMF's remit is very narrow. The IMF will not show you how to deal with your energy crisis. It will not tell you to go and sign a 10-year deal to deal with a two-year problem, as we have done with Turkey. The IMF will not tell you that you need financial inclusion. Make sure your people have bank accounts. That's not their remit. Uh, they will not tell you that, you know, you need to move from cash payments to electronic payments to grow your economy. They will not tell you to reduce taxes. Th those are things that you need to figure out. They will not, they, they'll say, have fiscal discipline, but you have to have fiscal discipline. This is not the first time the Ga Ghana has gone to the IMF. We've gone several times in the past. And most of those times, we have not been able to live according to our commitments. Fiscal discipline takes a lot of political will to do. And if you don't have that discipline, and this is going to be a tough program. In 2016, the Bank of Ghana is not supposed to lend even one peso to the government. One peso. It's going to be zero financing. Now, we think it's tough, and we will look to see how the government is able to deal with mm. this. It's going to be very interesting. But ultimately, the development of our country cannot be in the hands of the IMF. The IMF has a narrow remit. They give you room to take policies. They will not tell you to go and issue national ID cards. You have to take those decisions yourselves. Ultimately, we have to develop our economies ourselves. You cannot mess up and sit down and hope that the IMF is going to come and yeah. rescue you. No, that is not their remit. The development of our economies is in our own hands. Yeah. It's in our own hands. Nobody's going to do it for us. And we better think about that and better take the right policies to develop our economies by ourselves. What would your government do with the IMF deal? Well, they, they, it's, it's essentially an agreement with the country. It's not an agreement with a government or a, 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 a party, mm -hmm. you know. So you will have to take it as you meet it, if and 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 and, and try to implement what you can. If there are s aspects that conflict, you 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 can have discussions about it. Yes. So this can be renegotiated. Well, I think you know everything is always possible for renegotiation. Mm -hmm. I think that if you ask for a waiver on certain of the conditions for some reasons and you can articulate a case for it, uh, they would listen if you can make a good case and satisfy them that, you know, the ultimate objectives of, of fiscal consolidation, debt sustainability and all of that will be met. But it depends on what your own vision is, what your ideas are, and how well you are able to negotiate mm -hmm. it out. But I think that it's too early to start thinking about you know, renegotiating or whatever. They've just put this framework together. Uh, it was approved on Friday. Uh, and let us see how, how it, goes is, it goes out okay. and, 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 and we'll learn from it. Um, but ultimately, as I said, what we need are, are policies that, that 
have integrity and credibility. Mm -hmm. The IMF will not tell you that don't be, you, you know, too, you know you, you're, you're going, this is how you have to deal with corruption. No. Mm. It's not their remit. But okay. if you're a corrupt government, no matter what the IMF does, your economy is going to go down. Okay. Finally, yeah. you, you mentioned EaseWage. And EaseWage is, is a system that your government, the NPP government, I should say, put in place, yeah. um, trying to, you know, sanitize the financial operations yeah. and, you know, identity issues and all yeah. of that, like you were describing a short while ago. Yes. Can you describe to us what it really is and how well, you it's, it's roll a, it it's out? A, it's a system of, of uh, where it's a biometric payments card. Mm. It's a debit card, biometric payments card that has several applications. You can have on it your national ID, your passport, your national health insurance card, your voters card, your debit, I mean cash payment. You can have close to over 100 applications on that one card. And it works both in rural areas without electricity as well as online. Mm. You know, but we, we got it because of uh, the nature of our economy. Rural, a lot of rural areas don't have electricity, so we wanted a car that could be used across. Um, and um, thankfully, I think this government has begun to understand the value of the card. It took a long time, over six years. And we kept saying, this card, because of its biometric nature, can eliminate ghost worker problems in our country. Mm. Now, they didn't listen, but suddenly, I think finally, uh, because of the donors saying they were not going to issue any more funds if we don't deal with the ghost workers, suddenly now it's being used, uh, national service is being used, and uh, I think for all workers it will soon be used. Uh, and and yeah, it's got more than um, just that aspect. You, you can also transfer money very easily to anyone with the card. Can you vote with the card? You can vote with the card. I mean, it's, it's so unique uh, that I, I think it holds the key to financial inclusion and to all these multiplicity of cards. And I'm happy that, and I thank the government for, for recognizing its importance, and I encourage the government to look at it well because it holds a key. It holds a key to our development. Mm -hmm. If we really adopt it, the country will change almost overnight. Okay. 2016, you are going with Nana Adodankwa Kufuado yes. to be elected as the vice president for Ghana. What's your special message to Ghanaians? Well, thank you very much. I, my special message is that Nana Adodankwa Kufuado is a man of vision. He's a man of integrity. He's a man, he's a patriot, uh, and he's a very kind-hearted man. He wants this country to do well. He's not going to come into government to look for money for his own pockets. He is there to leave a legacy for our country. He's there to transform our economy, and I'm going to support him all the way. And we would ask people to give us a chance to give Nana Kufuado the chance to transform this economy. And, and so we are asking people to think about what we can do, uh, the possibilities. We want to build a new economy. We want to build a globally competitive economy. And we want the chance to do that, which will include everybody, not just a few, as we are seeing right now, enjoying the benefits. We want to include everybody, an inclusive growth in the economy. And so we should vote for MPP in the next election so that we can come to serve. Thank you very much. Dr. Maumudu Baumia. Thank you. Thank you very much for Much appreciated. Thanks Thank you, Chrissy. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Mohamed Baumia, Vice Presidential Candidate for the New Patriotic Party. This is the GH Files. Stay tuned. There's more coming.